Now, I guess if you ask many people that question, who are the saints, you may get a variety of different answers. Maybe some would say historical Bible characters. Some might say notable church leaders. And some would say, well, you could only be a saint after you're dead. At the end of the day, who does decide who or who is not a saint? Well, the only way in which we can answer this question is to look into the Bible and see how the Bible defines this word as saint and tells us who are saints and how and who they are chosen by. So let's have a look at the definition of this word beginning in the Old Testament. My screen is not working. There we go. So we have in this chapter that we've just read a few verses of, chapter 33, the word saints occurring twice. In, in God here um, is uh, speaking um, through Moses to the children of Israel in the wilderness. But we have this word saints, which in the Hebrew is this word kodesh. We don't need to understand Hebrew. Thankfully, we have concordances that help us. And this word Kodesh is most commonly translated as is holy 262 times. And essentially this, mean, this word means to be separated, to be sacred, to be sep set apart. Uh, and we're going to see that that really is the foundation definition of what this word saint means something set or someone set apart now in verse three of deuteronomy here we have a different word for saints in the hebrew uh, very similar kudosh uh, and again this word is translated holy most commonly uh, and here it, it means something sacred something holy and again, something that is set apart. So we have uh, a familiar definition, which is uh, uh, bringing to us a, a common theme. There is another verse, another Hebrew word for saints, which is in Samuel here. He will keep the feet of his saints. Uh, and here this word is called seed. Um, and this is translated mainly associated with specific men, someone who is godly, someone who is good, a godly man. And according to Strong's, this means someone who is faithful, someone who is kind, someone who is godly in his way of life. So that's the, the Old Testament usage of this particular word. When we come into the New Testament, the word does occur again. New Testament, we're here in Greek. We have an example here in Matthew 27, where at the time of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, we read that the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. They were resurrected from the dead and they are called saints. This is the Greek word hagios, which again is most commonly translated as holy. And this word holy, when used, does also speak of something that is sacred or set apart. So we're getting a common theme here where this idea of a saint is someone who is set apart. And we can see that the use of this word does speak of ordinary human beings that are alive upon the earth. We have a verse here in Psalm 16, which says, but to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. And the psalmist here speaks of two faithful men called saints who were living upon the earth. Let me just give you some example of people in the Bible who were called saints. And they're called saints while they're alive. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians speaks of himself and of those he is writing to. And to me who am least than the least of all saints is this grace given. So we associate himself with other believers and with him and them, he calls them together saints. 
the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is prophesied as a man who would come to be a saint. In Micah chapter 7 verse 2, we read the good man is perished out of the earth. And that is a prophecy of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ that occurred in the New Testament. But that word good is our very word in the Hebrew for saint. So Jesus was, in that sense, a saint. In the Old Testament, there's a character who was called a, a saint, Aaron, who was the high priest of God in the wilderness. Uh, we read in Psalm 106, they envied Moses also in, in the camp and Aaron, the saint of the Lord. So here we have examples of men who God has set apart to be, as it were, special people of his own. And that's what we're going to see the definition of a saint is. So a saint is someone who is set apart. I know, but know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly. Again, that is the word saint in the Old Testament. The Lord hath set apart him that is a saint for himself. The Lord will hear when I call him. So we know clearly from this verse that it is God who chooses who and who isn't a saint. And when he chooses a saint, he has a desire that they set themselves apart to him. So if a saint is set apart to God, what are they set apart from? Well, again, we have to look at what the Bible says and a Another verse in the Psalms which uses the word saint helps us here. We read in Psalm 97. Love the Lord, hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. So God, in a sense, is preserving the souls of his saints by separating them from the wicked, so to those who are separated from the evil of this world. And we get a verse in the New Testament that helps us here in Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. But here we read, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. So when God calls someone to be set apart, to be one of his saints, one of the requirements is to separate ourselves from the evil of this world unto the goodness of God that is described in his word, unto a way of life that is not like the world, but is like the descriptions that God has given to us as to what the characteristics of his saints are. We shall look at those in a moment. So a saint is a man or a woman who God has a wish should be separated from the ways of the world unto himself. Will you come with me to Colossians and chapter 1 in the New Testament, one of the writings of the Apostle Paul. Colossians and chapter 1. We have to see here how the saints are, in one sense, the same as any other human being in the world. But in another sense, they are different because they have made a choice. Colossians chapter 1 and at verse 21. And you, says the Apostle Paul, that was sometime alienated in your mind and enemies in your mind by wicked works. So those before they have been called to be separated to God, receive the call to become a saint, were once part of the world and were, as it were, part of the wicked works of the world. But God has a the desire that we should separate ourselves and that we should 
have a different motive in our lives. So he goes on and said, yet he has now reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy. And that word holy, again, means separate, similar to saint, and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. So we are all sinners. And in that sense, we're all separate from God because sin separates us from God. But through the sacrifice of Christ, our sins can be forgiven if we present them to God and we have a desire to be a saint and to be separate from the world and do our best to do so. Then we can have our sins forgiven, be separated from the world and unto God. We have a verse again in Romans chapter 8. He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. That word intercession speaks of a mediator. When we sin, we have a mediator who is the Lord Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand of God who can plead to God on our behalf for our sins to be forgiven. But he only does that for the saints, those who have a desire to be separated unto God and to do and live their lives in accordance with God's will. Again, in 1 Corinthians 1, he speaks to the church or ecclesia of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are, sanctified or or made clean in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. So those who are listening to this, when we know the word of God, we, we have received a calling and are presented with a choice as to whether we wish to be separated to God and from the world and therefore to be a saint. But what does that mean? What what does it mean to be a saint? What are requirements? What must we do? Well, step one is that we must believe in God and believe in his word, the Bible, and all that it says unto us. Again, in the Old Testament, in Psalm 31, O love the Lord, all ye his saints, For the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. So there's a calling to us that we must love God and then he will preserve our life. He will reward if we do that which is right to the best of our ability. So there is step one. Step two is to have an understanding. We can't really believe something unless we understand it and there's only one way to understand God and his purpose and that is to read the Bible and know God through it. We have a parable that's perhaps fairly well known in Matthew's gospel the parable of the sower and those that are uh, that receive the word of God which is the seed um, are here described He that receives seed into the good ground is is he that heareth the word and understandeth it and beareth fruit. So we need to hear God's word, which is reading it, but then we need to seek to understand it. And it's only then when we can understand it that we can then do what God's commandments are and, and bring forth fruit to him in our good works. That leads then to an action, which is baptism. And here we read in Mark 16 that it is a fundamental requirement. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. And therefore, having believed and understood, we must then make a decision to dedicate our lives to God, which we can do through baptism. That's the next step for a saint. That is then followed by a life that must be led in obedience to God's word. God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin once, yes, but ye have obeyed 
from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to him. So having read and understood the word of God and seen the need to be baptised, we must then obey the word of God. And then followed by a godly life, a life led in accordance with those commandments that we read. But know that the Lord hath set apart, made a saint, him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call him. And in the New Testament, the, the, uh, the work of a saint, distributing to the necessity of saints, looking after one another, providing for the needs of one another. And there's a, a practical work that is necessary for a saint to undertake. So those are five simple steps that really demonstrate for us the requirements for a saint or to become a saint in the eyes of God. But of course we have to understand that right at the beginning of this process it requires a call from God and as soon as we are called to the gospel then as soon as we hear and read about it we have received a calling. So what next? What is the future of the saints? We read in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 3, to the end we read here, that God may establish your hearts, unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. We know from the scriptures that if we undertake those five steps that we have just seen, that we ourselves have a hope of a future. And that future is spoken of as a time when the Lord Jesus Christ will return to the earth. And at that time, there will be a series of events that will take place which will directly affect the saints, the saints that are alive now, the saints that have lived in the past, and the saints which before Christ's return may be made saints in the future. So what is the next steps? Well, when Christ does return, and we know that he will, and Many events in the earth around us do indeed indicate that that time may well be soon. But when he does come, a series of things will happen. First of all, we read that there will be a resurrection. Will you come to the Psalms, Psalm 116? And here we, we read of the fact that the making of a saint in our life now is far from the end of the story. Psalm 116 verse 15. We have an unusual verse here. We read there, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Well, how can the death of someone be precious? Well, the death of a saint is precious to God. Someone who has lived his life faithfully knows that that is not the end. God knows that that is not, a, not the end, for there is something greater to come than the life that he has already lived. And we've already read, haven't we, or spoken of in Matthew 27, that when the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the, um, sorry, was put to death, that many people who had lived before arose out of their graves. They're called saints here, men who and women who had lived faithfully before. That was an example of what will happen when Jesus come back, comes back. Those saints in Matthew 27 would have died again because the kingdom hadn't come yet. But nevertheless, we know that when Jesus comes back, there will be a resurrection of all those who were saints in the past from the dead. Then there will be a next step. They will all be called to judgment, called to come and meet the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans 14, we read, 
But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And so at that time, it will be judged as to whether we have indeed become worthy of becoming an eternal saint. Whether the calling that we have received, we have made the most of and whether we have been obedient and led that godly life to the best of our ability, God knowing that we will fail at times. But where do our priorities lie? Where is our motivation? And who do we put first in our life? Those that are accepted at the judgment seat of Christ will then receive a change. A change of nature will be given unto those saints at that time. Again, in the Psalms, many of the Psalms speak of the saints in these ways. Ye that love the Lord, hate evil. He that he preserveth the souls of his saints. God will preserve our life, not just now, but in the future. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. We saw that before, but, but notice that, that God has a desire to preserve the soul or the life of his saints. But at that time, at that change of nature, that change of nature will be the granting of immortality. We read here of Philippians that God at that time will change our vile body, that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself. God is eternal. The Lord Jesus Christ has been made immortal. And that is the hope that is set before all the saints that have set their life towards God and away from the world. And at that time, the kingdom of God will be established. And that will take perhaps some time in order for all the countries of this world to be brought under the rulership of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ will not accomplish that on his own. He will accomplish it with all his saints that have been by this time made immortal. Again, in the Old Testament, we read until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Here is a prophecy of that future, that the saints will be given the power of judgment over the mortal nations when the kingdom is established. And they will possess the kingdom. They will be given rulership in the kingdom with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when the Lord Jesus Christ does return, there will be a necessity for the kingdoms of this world to be overcome by Christ and the saints. Many wars and battles will take place, but all nations of the earth will be subdued and the Lord Jesus Christ will sit upon the throne of David in Jerusalem and will rule the whole world. And there will be no rebellion for a thousand years and it will be the work of the saints with the Lord Jesus Christ to keep control of all nations and all peoples, to keep judgment upon those nations, to call way, to always bring them into line, as it were. And it speaks of a, a rod of iron being used, should there be any rebellion during that period. So there's a great work to be done. There's a great future in store for all those who have a desire to be a saint now, but more importantly, have a desire to be a saint in the kingdom of God. And speaking of that work of the saints in the kingdom, there are a number of key verses that we could go to. Let's just have a look at one or two that clearly explains to us what the future for us could be if we make the right decisions now. Come to 1 Corinthians and chapter 6, will you? Paul's first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 6. Verse 1. 
Here, the Apostle Paul is actually reprimanding some members of the Corinthian Ecclesia here. But notice what he says, dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Do you not know the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you not unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life. Just so we know when he speaks angels, they are just the word messengers. That would be earthly messengers, as there will be a mortal population in the kingdom. But here, very clearly, we're told that the future saints will have a worldwide job to do in judging the world and the inhabitants of it in the future. In Hebrews chapter 2 we read, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. And in this verse he is speaking of the angels that are in heaven, who at the moment are working with God and the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and bringing about the events of the world that will eventually bring the kingdom of God in the world to come, in the kingdom age, that job will be handed over to the saints for a thousand years and they will do what angels do now. Psalm 149, it speaks of this, this rulership that the saints will have in the kingdom. He says that the saints will execute upon the earth upon all upon the earth, the judgment written, this honour have all his saints, praise ye the Lord. So we're looking at these things, we see the necessity for us, if we want to be part of God's kingdom and to be a saint then, we have to want to be a saint now. We have to go through those steps that we must understand the necessity to answer the call from God, having been called to the Bible, to believe in God and his son, to understand what the Bible is trying to tell us, to respond to that in baptism, and then live a life of obedience and godliness before God. But let's bring our thoughts to a conclusion, shall we? Will you come with me to the second of Corinthians in chapter six? I put the verse up there, but let's just have a look at this verse together and see the context of it. We read here in verse 17, the call that we have, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Here is our call, separate yourself from the ways of the world. Don't touch the unclean ways of the world. And God says he will receive you. And what's the consequence of that? Well, let's conclude with the verse that follows. I will be a father to you. You shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord mighty. So let us answer the call of God. And let us make sure that when Jesus does come, which may be soon, that we are ready for that judgment seat. Thank you.